upon you. so much for coming out to the 2020 forum news service pre-session forum with the legislative leaders. We're so glad that you're here and thank you to all of our leaders for taking the time out. I saw that the governor brought some bars. <laughs> governor, do you want to talk about that? Why you brought the bars? These are an act of friendship. I, I would like to note that uh, Senator Gazelka pointed out I did not make them myself, so that is true, so thank you for that. But you're all welcome to them. It's, uh, I it's knew they start, were safe then. It was <laughs> to start for friendship, so. Bars for everybody. Do we turn them on or off, or how do we do that? It sounds like multiple are on at once, or is that okay? That's a technical question back there. Yeah, do we know how to do it? Yeah, don't ask me. This is are, we smart, are we smart enough for that? That feels above our pay grade. Yeah, you don't have to turn them on. There's a little feedback. It's a little bit too loud. I think they're just turned up too high. <clears throat> it's kind of a constant problem in this hearing room, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Well, now that we know what the bars are about, um, <laughs> we're thrilled to have all our legislative leaders this year, as well as the governor. And from, let's see, my right to left, we have House Assistant Deputy Minority Leader Ann New, Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka, Governor Tim Walls, House Speaker Melissa Hortman, and newly elected Senate Minority Leader Susan Kent. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, just a quick note for all the reporters before we get started. Remember, we have microphones, so please use them, and then remember to turn them off when you're done. Um, I think all of you should be set with your microphones. Hopefully not too much feedback. We'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, and with that, I'd like to just kick it off. Um, first question for Senator Kent, since this is your first um, time with us here. Um, I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about your vision for the Minority Caucus and what you think the leadership change means for Minnesota. Well, thank you for hosting this, and I'm uh, glad to be here with, with the colleagues and looking forward to a really great uh, 2020 legislative session for the people of Minnesota. Um, because when you ask about our caucus and our vision, that's what we're focused on. Um, we are really uh, focused on making sure that we are building a bright future for Minnesotans, making sure that they have access to affordable health care, that we have a really great bonding bill this year, great schools. Um, insulin would be good for people who need it and can't afford it. Um, you know, the priorities that we hear from around the state and from all of our communities, that that's what they need us focused on. And that's what, um, you know, I'm working with my colleagues, uh, and we're going to continue to fight that good fight for the rest of the session. We've heard some leaders in the Iron, Iron Range particularly say they're saddened that Senator Bach is no longer leading the caucus. Any word for them? What I say to everyone is that what we want to make sure is that every voice has a place at the table, that everyone is heard, that all of these issues get fair discussions and hearings, and then it's about really focusing on the basic priorities that we hear from Minnesotans, which again goes back to health care, good jobs, um, good schools, and that's the part that really matters. And those are what's important to everybody in Minnesota, regardless of where you live. And we know, and sent, uh, Governor Walls has made a really important message, loud and clear, one Minnesota, and that's what we're here to do. Senator Gazelka, would you care to respond to that at all? I know you've had some comments about the change well, in leadership. Yeah, I put out a video specifically for the range, since I'm from Virginia, Minnesota, that uh, we have their back. Uh, so whether it's mining or pipelines, uh, paper mills, uh, just the people up there, I think they are frustrated seeing their, their senator being removed from power, but that is the nature of this place. Uh, uh, I will say that I reached out to Senator Kent, and uh, it's my uh, in, my plan is that we're going to work together in the Senate. Uh, Senator Bach and I, I think, worked really well in the Senate, and uh, there's no reason that uh, Senator Kent and I cannot do the same thing. Governor Walls, could you react because you have a new person in the room, and for the first time in all of our time, in your time here, there's a majority of women with you at the <laughs> desk and what that means. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, thank you for noting that, too. I think uh, there's a great story here. I want to congratulate Senator Kent um, being the first woman 
to, uh, to lead that caucus. That speaks volumes to you, bringing that voice, especially from our suburbs, uh, where we've seen a lot of activity, a lot of political activity in these voices that come. Uh, I don't get involved with, obviously, the internal politics. I, I have been through these things. What I do know is um, it's going to be incumbent whoever sits here to figure out those issues that are best for Minnesota. And the team that came together did not know each other last year. I was uh, the newcomer to the Capitol. That team got together. And I, I still talk about it because I think it's worth noting. Um, we were able to make government function. We debated strongly and, and differed on issues that were core values of ours, but we got, we got those things done. And I uh, appreciate uh, folks being concerned about all corners of the state. I think that's probably why for the first time in 40 years they elected an, an outstate governor. I'm about equal distance as Brainerd is from down in Mankato. <laughs> so there's folks down there. So I think it's not trying to do that. We know we have to work at this and, and those, those realignments happen. I, I feel confident that this uh, caucus will come together, that the leadership of Senator Kent will be part of this team up here. And it was very gratifying. This is really uh, difficult to do in the climate that we're in. I think it's probably not lost on any of us, the national backdrop that this is against almost at the moment that we're doing this, um, that you still see what I believe is a true sense of, of collaboration and friendship to get things done with a very passionate ideological and philosophical differences. Back to the Senate. Sorry, House members, but the Senate's making all the news right now. So That's for a change. <laughs> Senator Kent, what's your history background? Are you able to hit the ground running on fundraising and candidate recruitment? Um, yes. Uh, you know, uh, we're really committed to making everything be seamless, really focusing on being successful as we move forward, and um, a lot of support and a lot of great teamwork, and we're going to do just fine. Thank you. Can you be more specific? Have you already been involved in recruiting candidates? Have you done in the past? Where are you at right now? We, we are in a great place. We're far ahead of where we've been in the past. We have some amazing candidates. Um, great work has been done by Senator Bach and Senator Kerry Dietzik, and I've done my share over time. And uh, I, I think this is going to be a pretty exciting November. Senator Gazelka, last year the, the House had a pretty robust criminal justice reform agenda that seems to have been sort of torpedoed by the fact that they coupled that bill with guns. The members of that, the Republican members on the committee wouldn't vote for it. It seemed to have died, most of it, because of the inclusion of guns. If the House were to accept some of the more moderate proposals that were talked about in Hibbing, decoupling those uh, <clears throat> measures that the Republicans clearly oppose. Could you see signing on, or the, the Senate signing on to some portions of the House's uh, criminal justice reform agenda? Well, I guess I would say stay tuned. I mean, they were together, and so that, that sunk that. But um, you know, there are a number of areas related to criminal reform that I would be open to at least discussing. And then back on the gun issue, um, there are a couple issues that I hope that we can find a way to get through. Both sides have uh, pretty strong positions on uh, aggressive uh, gun restrictions or aggressive gun freedoms, but there is some language in the middle that we've been proposing. One of them is the straw uh, purchase. If uh, somebody buys a gun for a known criminal or, or known someone that has a reason that they can't have a gun, right now that's just a misdemeanor, and we think that should be a felony. We think that's something that we could actually do that would be progress that perhaps both sides can agree with. And then the other one is, let's just focus on the laws that are already on the books. Uh, we, in one of the hearings, it came to light that 40% of those uh, people that had gone through due process uh, and were supposed to have their guns removed were not removed. And so I think we can find some common ground, but if we focus on far right or far left, none of that's going to happen. Can I follow up with Speaker Hartman? Do you see the potential of decoupling that issue, guns, from the rest of the criminal justice reform agenda in order to get more of that passed? Absolutely. And, you know, Minnesotans have been clear that they want us to take action to prevent gun violence. And the proposals that the Minnesota House DFL have, has put on the table are proposals that have passed in Republican-led states with Republican governors, Republican House, Republican Senate. 
And so we are not bringing forward far left ideas. We are bringing forward two and only two proposals which have passed in Republican led states and which have resulted in a reduction in gun violence. The two proposals that we have brought forward is universal criminal background checks on purchases and the red flag provision. The red flag provision, I've, I've heard unfortunately my colleagues inaccurately describe time and time again, so let me be very clear what the red flag provision would do, is it would allow a law enforcement professional, that is a sheriff, a police officer, a city attorney or a county attorney, to go to court and say that an individual, there is evidence to prove that an individual is dangerous to themselves or to other people. The gun owner gets notice and an opportunity to be heard. Should the gun owner choose not to attend that hearing, the judge can issue an ex parte order, but only for the time period where there is a danger. The most dramatic reduction we've seen is a reduction in suicides in states where this law has passed. So we are standing in the moderate middle on gun violence prevention, and we are waiting for Republicans to join us. I think Representative New, being in the House, should be a, have a counter to that House <laughs> provision. Yeah, I, th I think this is really critical. This is this is a really sensitive issue, obviously, for everyone. Um, and certainly, I have constituents as well who have been affected by gun violence, and and I and I understand that I'm very sensitive to that. At the same time, I think it's really important that we have that we have the facts on this. Um, there are some hearings in the in the red flag uh, provision that that would um, that would include the accused however there are also there's an ex parte portion of that in which in which the accused does not get to defend themselves they do not get to be a part of that hearing and those orders are issued and then the person is is uh, told that they need to request a hearing to then get their guns back. It's really important that we understand that. And, and it's, this is a tricky issue. It's sensitive because, because real people and real lives are at stake. And at the same time, this is a constitutional issue which puts it in a little bit of a different basket and we have to be very sensitive to that. Um, the other thing that I would say as, as far as these red flag laws go, and, and uh, Senator Gazelka has said this as well, you know, Minnesota has been, has been praised actually by Gabby Gifford's organization as one of the best states when it comes to the laws that we have on the books, um, when it comes to our gun safety laws. And as far as um, the gun violence going down, it is true in suicides, um, suicides by firearm have gone down in some of these, in, in, in these states that have passed uh, the red flag laws. However, it's important to note that the overall suicide rate continues to rise. And that means that taking the guns away via these red flag laws has not solved that problem. We, our position is that there are actually laws in place to care for people who really are in imminent danger. There's, there are 72 hour holds, there are, there are already tools at the disposal of law enforcement to ensure the safety of those people and that really is our primary focus. We wanna make sure those people are safe and if there really is imminent danger, Taking away a tool does not solve that. We want those people to be safe and we think that they should employ those tools of a 72 hour hold and making sure that, that their mental health is being cared for. But the problem with that, I've seen listening to law enforcement officials in my own community. And there was a story about a man who had been a hunter and a very legal, safe gun owner, but as he aged, his mental abilities were declining. And his family knew there was great risk. And they came to law enforcement and they asked repeatedly for help because he had guns and they did not feel like it was a safe situation. And they were told that given the current laws, there was nothing they could do. And yes, it ended in tragedy. We have to do better. That's, sim that's simply not true that there was nothing that they could do. And it's up to law enforcement either way. We're putting it in the hands of law enforcement either way with either of these, with either of these bills. So either law enforcement uh, takes action or they don't. We can't control whether or not that happens. We can make sure that they have the legal tools needed to be able to do it. And that was the problem. That's why I say we focus on the things we can get done. Um, <laughs> on the other side of it, there's... Uh, Many people in rural Minnesota that want stand your ground as an example. Uh, I'm just saying let's focus on the things that we can together get done. And I, there are some things. And if we're willing, we can do those. So Senator Gazelka, uh, Speaker Hortman has said that she will, does want to see those two provisions, background checks, red flag, pass off the floor this year. If they pass off the House floor, can you guarantee them a vote on the Senate floor? Uh, no, I don't know if they're going to come 
uh, in a large package like they did last time or separately. Um, I'll leave that up to Representative Hortman, but uh, we'll let the committee process do its work. Uh, we did promise that we would have uh, committee hearings. We've had two uh, that I think were very helpful for the state uh, to hear what's on the books and then what we can do. Uh, but I'm going to leave that up to the committee process. We intend to pass them as standalones individually. There were a lot of provisions that we brought to conference in budget bills last year because of an absolute refusal by the Minnesota uh, Republican-led Senate to talk about issues. And we, need, we felt that this issue, Minnesotans very clearly put it on our table. It was the predominant issue at the doors in the 2018 election. And that it, we owed a duty to Minnesota voters to bring the issue forward as far as we could. And, and the way to do that was to put it in the budget bill. There also is a small cost to implement both of the laws. Yeah, and I, th I think the biggest issue is Minnesotans want to feel safe. I, and that's uh, an issue that we all should care about and work on. We, we do have uh, an emphasis on public safety this, this session. Um, and, you know, how we work through that is important. That's why we wanted people to actually know what gun bills are on the, on the books right now. Um, you mentioned uh, Gifford. I think she ranks this as number 12. There's another group that ranks this as number 10 as far as strict as states. So it's understanding what's on the books right now, but also recognizing that people want to feel safe and whatever we can do that actually works, we should be open to. Since, since we have a pause, if I could just add, I think it's important because this is an issue that is really politicized and very partisan, but I think it's also important to note that there was actually bipartisan opposition to these bills in the House. Um, that, that is important to note. This is, not, this is not exclusively Republicans versus Democrats. There's actually bipartisan opposition to this. Hello. Um, Welcome back. Thank you, <coughs> Senator. Good to see you. Uh, Governor Tim Walls, I'm Ricardo Lopez. I'm with the Minnesota Reformer. Is this on? Um, and this question is for you, Governor. Um, what is your reaction to the push by former uh, Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Alan Page and many, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis President Neil Kashkari on the constitutional amendment uh, regarding education? Uh, I'm curious what it would mean for your plans on education and if it gains traction how would you work with Paige, Kashkari, and other stakeholders to have some influence on any outcome, given your background as a teacher? Well, thank you for the question, huh? Yes, I welcome it. I welcome this conversation. It is foundational to, uh, to I think, when I talk about One Minnesota, when I talk about that ability to get a quality education, black, white, brown, or indigenous, as we start looking uh, uh, what Minnesota's future is going to look like, what we're able to do, and, and in, I think we've all seen this. I'm, I'm certainly done admiring the problem that we have an achievement gap. I think we've you know, got this down, and I'm digging into the numbers. I had 261 indigenous students drop out last year. Uh, I had 1,468 uh, students who were homeless at certain times during the year graduate from school, and about another 1,531 um, that did not. So we know what these numbers are. We know that they're manageable. I will not allow people to continue to nebulize this issue that it, it's so big, it's so huge that we just can't get our mind wrapped around it. We certainly can. And I think this conversation about putting um, an emphasis there, I hope this opens up the conversation about housing. I hope it opens up a conversation about accountability, about what it takes to have those families succeed. So I, uh, I want to thank uh, Director Kashkari and Justice Page, of course, for being part of that. We're going to have to make sure everyone's there. What we don't need to do is, is fall into camps and, and this to be some type of tax bill around vouchers or whatever it might be. That's a, le that's a legitimate discussion. But this issue about what our children need to get is certainly welcomed. Um, the one thing I would caution against is um, we have a lot of provisions in law, you know, from Brown versus Board of Education and others that have asked us to do this. We still have not got there. But I think it opens up a very broad conversation, one that I think all of us up here want to answer. Um, I think it, it forces us to, uh, to look for new ways to get this done and to talk to one another with children at the center of that discussion. And so this is a good thing. This is a good discussion to have. Um, I hope this ends up um, sparking a lot of conversation in the legislative session this year. Certainly we're on, and I hope we get to this because I Spent a lot of time down in the sewers and stuff trying to make the case on, on a bonding package, a local jobs bill. Um, but that we can walk in and chew gum. We can do that. And, and I think these discussions, Jared, and I think this is one where you're going to see, if, if you read that language, the only thing I think I would, 
I think we need to call it what it is in, in the proposed amendment language. We need to say race. If this, this is race, this is what this is about. It does not specifically call out race because um, that's where our are uh, where we're falling down. And I think I have to look at uh, knowing if a, uh, uh, a child of color, uh, an African-American student walks in a classroom with my child, uh, regardless of their abilities, uh, we know that one child is going to face uh, discipline issues in a lot, are going to be disciplined uh, disproportionately. We also know that we're going to have achievement scores that aren't going to be as high. That has to end. So we welcome it. It's a, uh, it's a great conversation starter. I've heard some really positive conversations from everybody around this. So I think it's a good start. If I, if I could follow up, um, given your, like I said, your background as a teacher, do you feel like you are even in a better position as governor to, to sort of get into the nitty gritty around education on this? Um, I mean, you, you, were te you were a teacher in Mankato, um, and I don't, I mean, I can't re recall off the top of my head how many governors in the past have come from public school teacher backgrounds, but, you, but you're one. So do you feel you know, an additional sense of responsibility of being in this conversation more directly? Yes, and, and I certainly don't believe that makes me the only expert on this, I want to be clear. Uh, children, parents, others in there, the educators are in the classroom right now. But I do think it brings a unique perspective. I also do, and I, I will, I've said this since I've been here, it brings a unique responsibility not just being the governor, but someone who says they're a teacher governor, which I am. I spent 20 years of my life doing this. Uh, I will hold myself up to that. If that, uh, if that achievement gap, that opportunity gap, the disproportionality of what happens in Minnesota, if we are not able to show measurable numbers and progress towards that, I consider that's my responsibility to be a part of that. I feel like I've got partners that want to get at that. We've had, even in a budget year, we had some very, I think, fruitful and deep discussions around this issue where we actually listen to one another. And so, yes, I do uh, believe that. I think you're going to see, um, we've been working for quite some time on this. When I say we, working with a lot of stakeholders, parents, students. We were down in Rochester listening to students, taking all the commissioners down there. We'll be putting out uh, proposals that I think can find a lot of bipartisan support to do what we all know we need to do, give every child that opportunity and to provide a workforce that the state needs, because I keep using this, even if you remove the moral argument about this gap that we have amongst communities of color, over the next 20 years, 70% of our workforce is coming from communities of color. We already know at 3% unemployment and the difficulty it is finding folks, we got to have these folks, these kids ready to go. As long as we're on the topic. Can I stay on the topic for a second? Because I have publicly said um, that I've, I'm not warm to the idea of a constitutional amendment related to um, this. and. Uh, partly because I want to protect the legislative process, yeah. but I also have to say that I'm, I'm willing to explore it uh, because what we have been doing has not been working. And you know, I also get a chance to travel and talk to other state leaders from around the country, and there are plenty of other states where Republicans and Democrats are willing to do reforms uh, bipartisanly, and so that's what I'm hoping that we look at in Minnesota. What is it that we could try to do something different because what we've been doing has not been getting the results that we have. And so that's where you know, I want to be open to this and open to reforms because I, I totally agree with the governor with where we're at with the achievement gap. It's absolutely unacceptable. You look at our uh, kids of color and compare that to other urban areas in other states and we fall below them. So it's not just the spread in Minnesota, it's what are we doing and it's not working. And so let's, let's not be afraid to look at reforms. Uh, some reforms maybe we, we can't get to for whatever reason, but there's got to be things that we agree that we should try. And if we can even find them this year, great. And uh, I come from, I have lived in states that are notorious for having much weaker education systems, which is a big part of my passion for mm -hmm. Minnesota's education system and making sure that it's working for all students. Um, but we do have an absolutely unacceptable disparity in, in, our, in our children's experiences and in their outcomes. And, um, you know, but we are seeing things that are working. Yes. You know, we're all working on this. Nobody is just sleeping on this issue. We are all really trying and seeing some successes, for example, through through full uh, service community schools. There are some amazing results that are happening in schools around the state. But that takes a real commitment to make sure that we're providing that sort of support for our students and, and recognizing those results, is, and, and that's what it takes. I would echo that. I, I want to keep, we do have these, like Washington Magnet School, 90% community of color, 90% free and reduced lunch, 90% graduation rate. Um, we're getting achievements, so I think what gets lost in this is that we, 
that top part's doing pretty well. I also want us to be careful, and I, I ask all of you, this is a time to interact with the press, that I, I hear about the achievement gaps. One child falling through the cracks is too many. So I want to be very clear with all of you. I view this as a zero-sum proposition, but it's important when we're putting out things. I saw somewhere where we had a drop-off of, uh, of achievement rates, of graduation rates of 17.5% amongst a subgroup, Pacific Islanders and Hawaiian. One student left because of the small number that we have there. And I'm not saying that to minimize, just to be very clear. That one student is a loss for us. Whatever happened there, we need to know. But I think getting our mind wrapped around what this problem is, understanding where we're at. And because and I say this because I think we have to think about this very deliberately, almost like medicine is starting to think about individualized medicine. If I'm telling you last year we, we lost a total of, uh, of about, uh, as I said, 261 Native Americans, we could each have one student, if you would, in the numbers and say, this is how do we think about mentoring? How do we think about that personalized care? Students and teachers at Rochester told me the reason they're succeeding at John Marshall High School there is, is about the relationships. It's about seeing things differently. It's about building with the outside. I just met with a group from Candeoha County with an outside group of a bunch of business owners that helped them in an entrepreneurial class that meets before school. And the stories these students told, they, this sense of how lifted up they were of rural students, which of course zip code has a big impact on this too, and they were succeeding in a very unique program that was a public-private partnership that was working to bring them in. So I'm hopeful on this, and the numbers are, are achievable, and I think Senator Kent's point on this is, is we have things that are working, we need to duplicate those, and we need to not be afraid to take a few chances. The House will be taking on this issue in a big way. We will be having a full day symposium on uh, the opportunity gap. And I think it's really important that we call it the opportunity gap and not the achievement gap because it's important to put the responsibility on the adults who are responsible for funding the school system and not on the students who find themselves in schools. Uh, every, every child in the state of Minnesota has, has an equal capability of, of achieving and moving forward. It's our job to provide those opportunities. And much like the majority leader had his community conversations on cannabis all over the state, we will be diving in deep on the opportunity gap, listening to all stakeholders who have different ideas, but most importantly, engaging with communities of color who are most affected by this. We have a people of color and indigenous caucus, and they have really a phenomenal and robust uh, legislative agenda, and we'll be partnering with them on these conversations. As long as we're on the topic of constitutional amendments, uh, there's one out there about slavery and the Constitution, uh, the existing Constitution, and taking that word out. Are there any other amendments that you plan to advance either through the House or the Senate to the ballot this fall? I can't think of any. No, no, we don't. And the, the photo ID, for those that want to know, we're not looking at that as a constitutional amendment. It would be more through the legislative process. And, and what about the, uh, the slavery amendment that uh, the St. Paul Police Chief has brought to the fore? I personally, at this point, know very little except for what I read in the newspaper, and it seems like kind of a no-brainer that we would remove that language from the Constitution. The question is, when do we want to put that on the ballot, and will, will people have enough time to be educated about it to make the right decision? The, the worst thing in the world that I could imagine is that we rush something to the ballot without having the proper time to educate the electorate, and that we have you know a vote coming out of Minnesota affirming slavery or something like that. So I'm, I'm very interested in having the conversation. But I need to learn more, and we need to really think very thoroughly about the timeline. <clears throat> Kevin Featherly, I think I forgot to introduce myself before. Um, on sexual harassment, we had two polar opposite proposals in the Senate and the House last year, and two, I think we actually had two polar opposites in the Senate. What's going to happen this year? Are we going to see some, some meeting of minds on this? And will your presence as my, minority leader in the Senate change that conversation on that side of the Capitol? Should I start out? Go right ahead. I've been fighting this battle uh, since 2017 when one of our members experienced sexual harassment in the Minnesota House of Representatives. And um, fortunately, we're now at least um, beginning with having members um, annually get some training on uh, how not to harass and discriminate against people based on gender or other differences. But we need to change the law for Minnesotans because, because when you look around in workplaces in Minnesota, 
there still is a lot of sexual harassment and there are people who are wronged by that sexual harassment and they don't get to have their day in court because the courts are applying a standard that is too strict. Minnesota has a cause of action for sexual harassment. Under the federal law, there's just the general gender discrimination law. And in that federal law, courts have been applying a severe or pervasive standard. In order to prove something is sexual harassment, it has to be severe or pervasive, so severe and pervasive to change the terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. In Minnesota, we acted as a legislature in 1993 to create a cause of action for sexual harassment. And the standard that the courts are applying is not the standard they should be applying. Women are not getting a day in court for things as disgusting and revolting as a, a superior exposing his penis to a woman for four minutes. That's not long enough. That's not severe and pervasive. That doesn't get you to a jury to determine whether or not you've been sexually harassed on the job. So what we have in the Minnesota Senate, actually, is a bill introduced by Senator Karen Housley that would codify severe and pervasive. It would say, okay, I recognize there's a big wall in between you and the courthouse wronged individual, but we want to firm up that wall that's existing in case law. We want to take that over and put it into the statutes. The House has said, we trust juries to, to um, make this decision, and we have to let people have a day in court so that the people who have done wrong and who have made it impossible for a woman to get her work done have to be held accountable to that by a jury of their peers. And part of what I think is interesting about this journey is over the past two years, you look at how this has gone. Uh, two years ago, these were bills that were offered by Republican uh, Senator uh, Karen Housley and Republican uh, House member uh, Joyce Pepin. And had pretty good support, um, some, bi you know, some bipartisan support, but it got shut down in the, in the Senate. Um, and I remember Senator Gazelka and I had a, a, a conversation about that on the floor after I offered it as an amendment because we felt strongly that we needed to keep having this conversation. And so I think it's interesting that Senator Housley has now kind of gone the opposite direction from her previous bill where she would in fact codify what she was previously trying to remove. Um, and as we've seen, it is, it is a standard that's just not tenable and does not protect women. If I can follow up, Wait, Senator Kent, can I follow I get, up? Well, go ahead. Just on that, again, how much are you willing to fight for this? I know just a few moments ago, the Speaker of the House at our briefing said, your election changes this issue. She brought this up and said addressing sexual harassment will happen now because she said previously she did not have an ally in the room before. Are you that ally and will you fight for this? I definitely look forward to working with the speaker on this and anybody else who is willing to take up this fight. But I will point out that the Senate DFL caucus voted unanimously in 2018 to support my amendment to get this introduced. So um, we're, we've been a willing partner all the way through, but I do have a, an extra interest in this, I would And say. just to be clear, I didn't say that the law change would happen because the Republicans still control the Senate. What I said was it would be nice to have another ally in the room um, and not being the only uh, woman leader of the four leaders. Well, and to respond, and frankly, I don't care if you're a man or a woman, sexual harassment is wrong in, in any form. And when we can take steps to prevent that, we should. Um, working at changing the law is always complicated, and that's that's part of the, the issue. I, I, we were willing to take some steps to uh, address sexual harassment uh, in addition to what we did in the Senate proper, our, our whole... Uh, um, policy related to that was changed. It was bipartisan and fully fully adopted. But um, but I'm always careful because I think words matter, and I want to make sure what we when we change something that we don't have any unintended consequences. And so the idea is is building coalitions where you get people to agree on where we need to go and why. The first step is agreeing that sexual harassment is always wrong. There's, there's never a a reason for it. And then how do you move towards making sure that you correct that without uh, doing unintended consequences? We hold harassers accountable. That's how we change it. Yes, we do. If, if I could just follow up on that, because, you know, I, I think it's notable that, you know, as someone pointed out earlier, there are a majority of women, um, you know, before us now. Um, but I also want to ask sort of the question to the men and just, you know, I, like how pervasive do you think sexual harassment is generally in the workplace, including you know, the Minnesota's legislature. I, I'm just curious to sort of get a baseline of where, let, where I'll, everybody ate. Let me speak is. for the uh, Senate because I think um, I, I have not seen it and we didn't, I looked back 10 years and we didn't have any recorded offenses that I remember. Um, and I, I, I can only speak for the Republican side, but we, we uh, thoroughly go through the, the anytime anybody feels uh, unsafe, un, uh, 
in that environment we want to know, and we just didn't have any of that. That's the really good news is um, I think it's a, I, I hope that it's considered a good workplace environment uh, from both sides of the aisle. Yeah, so, so that's where the Senate's at. Yeah, I, and I would add, I think um, one thing that I just on a personal level try to do is I think that there are lots of things that do not rise to the level of sexual harassment, but I suspect my women colleagues would agree that we're in lots of situations where women might feel uncomfortable with something that is said or, or, or whatever it may be. And I, I've, I've taken some personal responsibility for pointing that out to my male colleagues. When, when they say or do things, I, I like to give them the benefit of the doubt that, that perhaps um, times are changing and, and they have come up in a time where, where maybe things were considered appropriate that are no longer considered appropriate. And, and I think we do need some guidance um, in, in helping um, our colleagues to understand what that is. But I think it is really, really important because this has gotten a lot of press and a lot of coverage and media attention. I think it really is important to recognize that um, I think, I think the, the legislature is a safe place. And, and I think that the vast majority of people have good, positive experiences, and we do feel safe, and it's, and it's a good, positive working environment. And there have been some notable exceptions to that, and I'm, and I'm glad that those have been dealt with well, and that we've actually had, like, as, as Speaker Hortman pointed out, we had uh, both a Republican representative and a, and a DFL senator, both who left office over, it, over that, and that's probably the best thing that could have happened in those situations. Governor. Hey, hey, everybody. If I, I would just respond on this, and I, again, not I, I'm looking across state government and but society in general. I would say, unfortunately, I think the issue is still very pervasive. I, I don't have a a woman in my life who hasn't explained to me how pervasive this is that it's still there, and those are broader cultural changes. I think as these bodies are looking at what they do, we view state government. We need to be the role model. In, in all of these things we do. If we're asking others to do certain things or we're passing legislation, we need to do that. And I know in my office several things that I, I am responsible for this as the governor, and it goes down through MMB and all of the other agencies, but we brought in folks and, and have an advisory committee around this. One of the things is, as I said, well, let's bring these groups in that I meet with regularly, survivors group. I said, why don't you show them the training video? which of course they looked at it and said, yeah, that's not very good, that training video that you do, just that. And again, I don't want to be clear about it, that there's more that we can do. Um, and then looking at things, one of the areas where we saw right next door in, uh, in Wisconsin, uh, very unusual move, the adjutant general of the Wisconsin National Guard was removed because of the lax oversight of expected federal uh, guidance on sexual harassment in the military. So I think it's still prevalent. I think there's an opportunity for, for us to be the role model in this, and again, um, the law will take care of the folks there. But I think it's just much more prevalent than we than we think. And so um, we're we're looking in what we control, state agencies, uh, to be the zero tolerance role model in this. But I, I certainly uh, I certainly know that this this discussion will happen this this cycle. Governor, on that point, in the past, MMB has recommended that there be an independent office that would investigate such complaints in state agencies. What happened with that idea? Yeah, I, and we're still bringing in folks, and, and I want to know this too because I think that's a good idea, and I think what you're seeing out of our administration, this idea about having third-party validators and eyes on the outside that are seen with the trust that people have, whether it's looking at policy uh, proposals or a process, um, this is one that, that we are still in the process of looking at. And, and I do think that makes good sense. I'm going to, again, because of the agencies are in this, what I can tell you is, I'm taking a, a much more active role. And just so, I mean, this is the expectations, and I'm hoping this has always been done that way. Every single piece of training that every employee in Minnesota has to take, I take. I sit there and watch the videos. And that's where I come out of this saying, I'm not certain that I feel really trained about what I just saw there and what were the questions to be asked. So that is still being talked about. But the advocates are there and at the table. And I would add that two years ago, I carried a bill for MMB that would have really addressed some of these issues across state government, provided a number of uh, uh, tools and resources to, to really clarify this for all state agencies and all state employees. Um, but of course, it did have a price tag. Yes. If you're going to do this and do it well, you need to put some resources into it. And there was absolutely no appetite from Senate Republicans to you know, make any sort of investment in, that, in, those, in those steps. 
We could just have the governor and his team go through the, the Senate version. It's pretty good. Yeah. So. And, and just to clarify on that, codifying this, uh, the severe and pervasive language in state law, I mean, that would extend outside of state government because, I mean, I, right. I was at Variety Magazine when the Harvey Weinstein story broke, so I had to learn a lot about <laughs> sexual harassment and how it percolates. But, you know, one of the things that's well known is that women of color in low-wage jobs you know, disproportionately are affected by this, whether it's restaurant work, housekeeping, you know, home, you know, these, they are more often working out of economic necessity and are less likely to report harassment. So curious if you could touch on how that legislation would provide more protections for people like that. Well, here's the problem too, is if you, you take a, a person who's already disinclined to report that they have been harassed in the workplace, and then you have a standard that's so high that their case gets dismissed and they never get a chance to bring it to a jury, that's a further disincentive for people to bring their cases forward. That's why it's so important that we get rid of the severe and pervasive standard as it's being applied by the courts in sexual harassment cases. The best way to get people to come forward is to show that when you do come forward, we will take action and the individual who has harassed you, if it is proven that that individual has harassed you, will be held accountable for their actions. And I think that's a really important clarification because we've been talking a lot about um, the legislature and state agencies. But yes, the purpose of this is to protect every Minnesota worker from sexual harassment. Hey, all. Uh, Minnesota has had a ban the box law for quite some time, but there seems to be an exception to it um, for applicants to state boards and commissions. That's like the little advisory councils, but also the PUC and the Met Council and so on and so forth. Uh, Governor Wallace has told us that he wants to get rid of that exception and extend that ban the box law to applicants for boards and commissions. And I just wanted to hear from leaders in the House and Senate on um, whether they've been thinking about that and where they stand on both ban box law in general currently and also I ex whether they want to extend it to applicants for boards and commissions. Generally, the governor and I find ourselves on the same page, and I think we find ourselves yeah. there on this one as well. If it's a loophole, we need to get rid of it. Agreed. Is that, is, that, is, are you, is that the issue where you're applying for a job and you have a felony or background? Mm -hmm. Exactly. The state on initial applications for boards and commissions currently asks whether people have a felony, and that's publicly disclosable on the forums right now. I'm certainly willing to discuss it. I read some data from uh, a guy named Thomas Sowell, a, a, a black economist. Um, he talked about uh, the data he was looking at seemed to say that there were less people of color that got hired, not, I'm not talking public, but in the private sector, because if they couldn't ask that question, then they, they uh, didn't uh, uh, hire as many people from that group of people. And so I'm certainly willing to look at it, um, but we, again, we need to be careful of what we're trying to do and did it accomplish what we really wanted it to do. I, th I think an important point that you just made um, is that is that the appointments to boards and commission then it, that is publicly disclosable, um, which does give a little bit different. Uh, it, it makes this a little bit different than, than private employment where that is not going to be publicly disclosed. So I think that is a privacy issue that we probably need to take a really close look at. Because I, th I think when we talked about this earlier, I, the, because you removed it and everything else, it appears like it was maybe an oversight. I mean, that's what we look. And just to be clear, the people who apply, um, it is not a disqualifying factor. But what I've said is it very well could, and this is the nature of this, that just being on there stops people from even applying, that they, they don't. And, and think about this, in, in some of these cases, like with some of the things around corrections, we're actually looking for people that have the experience necessary. So it's really ironic, you know, a wrong question to ask that we're actively seeking people who have been incarcerated for some of these boards to provide feedback on this, and yet the question is asked on there. So any help, and it's gonna have to be statutorily removed, it, it's a fairly narrow group that got forgotten on these. Yeah, and if I'm, I, it's not my area of expertise, but I also, uh, I know there was some discussion about initially excluding it, and then if they make it through the first interview process, then it is available. So I, I don't know, I mean, but it's worth pursuing. Yep. If you could perhaps start with Senator Kent and move down the line, and have each of you um, say what would be your top priority for that $1.3 billion surplus. Ooh, um. I'm going to say um, uh, uh, something I've worked on for a very long time, that the way it's uh, set up is really well done for one-time funds, and that is to um, in make more available more of the matching grants for school counselors, psychologists, social workers, and nurses. 
What I will be looking at is those things where we can make a difference with a one-time uh, batch of funding. I know not a lot of the surplus will be recurring, and so we don't want to make commitments over the longer term that we can't then fund later. But you're only three once. You're only four once. And if we choose to dedicate some of the surplus that's one-time non-recurring money to provide quality early childhood education experiences, the three-year-old, this year's three-year-old that we provided to carries that benefit with them the rest of their life. And it would be sad if we couldn't also provide it to next year's three-year-olds, but we don't need to make the commitment to next year's three-year-olds to make a difference in a lot of lives. Uh, the rainy day fund and bond servicing for a robust uh, jobs projects bill. I know it's a big price tag, and if it had to be, I'd agree to phase it in, but fully exempting Social Security income, I, I really believe with our workforce shortage that uh, there are more people would stay in Minnesota. I think, I think you're going to find in the future that more seniors are working, which we want them to do, and exempting Social Security income is a more, more attractive. We have, uh, we're one of only 10 or 12 states that uh, taxes Social Security income, and if we could get rid of that, Acknowledging that it's a big price tag, that would be good for Minnesota. Yeah, and I, I would agree. I think it's important to note that that last year was our budget year, and we have a fully funded state budget for the next two years. That was agreed to by the Re Republican Senate and the Democrat House and the Democrat Governor. So we have a fully funded state budget for the next two years. And so I would agree with Senator Gazelka. I'd like to see some tax relief, particularly for our seniors via Social Security income. Uh, we are one of just a handful of states that continues to tax Social Security income, um, and that is money that could be certainly very helpful. In the, in the pockets of our seniors. If I could just respond on that, just we still are $491 million short on the, that we spent out of the reserves. And I want to be clear, 70% of Social Security is already exempt from that. We received $19.05 billion in Social Security into Minnesota. $5.91 billion of it is what's taxed. It's the $15.50 and then the 100% on this. So a person making $10 million a year is exempted right away on the 15%. And that scale goes down. We, in the budget that I put out, we move that exemption up to keep pace with inflation and things that happen. So I want to be clear when you're talking to seniors. Seniors like my in-laws, who are lifelong teachers, their Social Security is not taxed. It has a heavy price tag. That money that would go back would no longer be money that could be used for age-friendly things like transit and other things that get seniors the quality of life in Minnesota that ranks very high. So I think when we talk about this, we need to be very, very clear when you talk to people, 70% of Social Security coming into Minnesota is not taxed. So it's very counterintuitive to realize that the Social Security tax cut that Senator Gazelka and Representative New are talking about is actually a tax cut for wealthy people. Okay, but that assumes that you're calling wealth, the wealthy people, people who own $44,000 a year. That's where that tax cut, tax kicks in. I don't think that anyone would argue that someone making $44,000 a year ranks among the wealthy. What we would say is somebody who's making $10 million a year doesn't need a tax cut. Which is not very many people. I think we disagree on this one, but I'll tell you what, Governor, I'll do the 491 reserve, you do the Social Security, we'll call it good. <laughs> so I, so uh, just to be clear, teachers, firefighters, law enforcement, they pay on their retirement. Um, and just, uh, again, this is an issue. I, uh, I know when we talk to folks about this, but we need to think about it's always, and this is a fair discussion, we had it last year, I think, to be reminded, folks, we collectively together cut income tax, we bumped up the Social Security exemption, we were able then to also do some of the other things we need. So it's a trade-off. It is a trade-off. If you want some of those states that don't tax that, um, then I, those states don't provide the same amount of services. So this is a discussion we'll have. Um, but I think the good news is, and I want to say thank you to the folks up here, thank the folks that did this, Minnesota is in a strong financial place. We've reached compromises to make sure that people are able um, to continue to receive health care. We were able to strike balances. And so I think this is a really good discussion to have. Yeah. Some folks here sat here during the billion-dollar deficits. That is a much worse place. That's why I keep coming back to We are in the largest expansion in our nation's history. Um, I think it would behoove us 
to think towards the future that there is going to be a natural downturn no matter who is president, no matter what policies are put in place, there will be that natural peace. And if you don't have those reserves in place, then you have to make decisions about plowing the roads or what happens at our long-term care facilities. And so I'm going to... I'm going to argue a very conservative save for a rainy day position. So. Well, Gov Governor, you've convinced me. Let's, let's do the, let's do the no, he, he's right. I mean, the reserves are uh, very, very important. It took uh, a lot of work to get to where we're at. I don't think we're going to have a, a recession for a, a year or two. At least that's what the, the forecasts are. But it will happen. And uh, I was in one of those $6 billion short government, government uh, being short, and that was extremely difficult. So. There's something we, we agree on. It. Well, we'll have to wait and see what the numbers are in February, and I'm not going to propose any um, spending that isn't responsible. But what we have to look at when we look at the size of the reserve is also the needs that people in our community have, and we have to balance um, looking at that. And I think having a healthy reserve is really important. This is Governor Dayton's legacy to the state of Minnesota. He restored this state to fiscal balance, and we have this inc incredibly healthy reserve, and we should do all we can to make sure that it stays healthy. If after having a healthy reserve, we have extra money that is non-recurring one-time funds, I'd like to invest it in this year's three-year-olds and four-year-olds. History should show that it was uh, Senator Bach and Senator Scoy, Democrats, that really were the ones that were passionate about the reserves. Governor, you said that, <clears throat> excuse me, one of your two top priorities is you, you called it the uh, jobs and projects bill. I believe that's a euphemism for bonding bill. That's right. <laughs> uh, in recent years, at least, that, that bill has been one that's been done in, in the dark of night behind closed doors. Um, you have talked about opening the process, but I want to hear from the legislative leaders, see if you're committed to having an open bonding process that the public can actually participate in and see the projects being put into those bills. Yes, and I think, um, you know, Chair Murphy is just a, a really incredible chair. She used to be a public school teacher, so she has very thorough hearings. She even gives members homework to do and to bring back and encourages robust participation by Democrats and Republicans. And I think if you go online and you look at the video archives of Chair Murphy's committees last year, you will find extensive hearings on projects throughout the entire session and a, a sincere and consistent invite to Republicans to be part of drafting a bill with us. And, and the bill did get voted out of committee and sent to Ways and Means, but there was no appetite um, on the Republican side of the aisle. So uh, we got to a point at the end of last session where uh, the Republicans decided they had a sequester uh, Representative Erdahl, they wouldn't let us talk to him. They told their members to stop going to Chair, Commit Chair Murphy's uh, Capital Investment Committee. So it's very hard to have a bipartisan agreement with the Republicans in the House when they reached a moment in time where they chose to stop participating. So uh, Representative Dowd and I have had some really good conversations about bonding. I appreciate he has acknowledged that that $1 billion cap is arbitrary and outdated. And he is committed to taking a look at the substance of what's in the bill and to not make a decision just based on some arbitrary cap. So I am really hopeful. Uh, Representative Dowd and I have already had a really good conversation on bonding. And I hope that um, that will continue. I hope that their members are allowed to fully participate with Chair Murphy through the process. And, and if I can... I think bonding and uh, the process in general I want to just talk about, which would include bonding. And both the speaker and I uh, tried to have um, the process go quicker so that we could have more time and more transparency. Um, and, and what I want to say that we're doing different between last year and this year is we have something called is it called One Minnesota? Did you take it from that? <laughs> no, but anyway. The, it is called One Minnesota. Not, not, pervasive. I, I was thinking I got it wrong. But anyway, uh, we do that every right before session. And we both uh, wanted NCSL to come in and teach a class that both the Speaker Hartman and I went to on negotiating. Because some of the breakdown, uh, I think, is is at the, the chair, the, the conference committee position where when two parties are very far apart on many issues, uh, there never seemed to be any give or letting go of the things that the other side was not going to agree on. And so we're going to bring them in. That's, that's both of us working together, saying we want the process to work better, and, and we want our leaders un, that are serving under us to make sure that they realize that there are times you just got to let stuff go. And, and if we do that, uh, the process will be much more transparent. So stay tuned to that. 
I would just mention on that too, we just finished up today, I believe the last one, but both the speaker and the leader have uh, asked their leadership uh, to come in and, and meet with us to talk about priorities in each of the areas. Um, with the bonding folks were in with me yesterday. And, and I think that's been really healthy because the commissioners were there with me. They've got to see that we were laid ours out. So it's out there kind of as a marker. And then they're coming in, setting in there. So we had the Republican leads come in and we had the Democratic leads come in. So we're starting, I think, a little further down the line. We're starting to know where it's at. And I'm trying to be as you know, as, as candid as I can be, and they think they've heard me, this is what I think for a local jobs project bill. I'm talking, as the speaker said, about um, thinking about a supplemental budget in terms of healthy reserves, but then there is time, there is space for one-time spending that, that should make sense. Uh, in, it was, uh, sales taxes were up, people were spending, uh, co corporate franchises were up, that's where the money came from, um, and those gives us an opportunity to build on the things that make both of those things continue to grow. But, but building off of Bill's question, you're talking about people coming into your office, closed office, to talk about stuff, Toward the end, we, we've gone weeks without hearing public discussion about the key things on the table. Are you guys committing to doing things in a more open, daylight process where the public can actually see what's being moved for what or what's, what's happening and what's not happening and why? When you look at the process that the three of us use, it's leaps and bounds ahead of where we were in the uh, locked, darkened Capitol of 2011, or uh, the Senator Bach office building at 11.20 p.m. Um, the last night of session in 2013, or the Bach and Doubt cigar deal on the bonding bill in 2016. So I would say the process that we went through was to have the chairs and the commissioners get done everything that they could in the conference committee process. We encourage them to have all those meetings in public and only for those intransigent uh, members who couldn't uh, get um, an agreement without uh, coming in to talk to the leaders. Only in those very limited circumstances did we weigh in. We recognize the expertise is in those committee chairs and in those commissioners, and we recognize that the work that we do is the public's business, and the public should see absolutely as much of it as they can. I think we made progress this year. We're still sausage makers working in a sausage factory, and um, there's definitely uh, more room for improvement. I would just say before we go to the on this process, especially around bonding, is that, that some credit should be given on this. This thing was written right in front of you in the sewers of Minneapolis, up on boxes <laughs> lifting me up and elsewhere. And the reason for that was is these were the projects that were coming in and that was what was being vetted. So you can guess pretty much when we're in negotiations that, that I'm arguing from that position on those projects and there's other arguments that are happening. I want to stress. Anything that can, we can do publicly uh, should absolutely be done. I think it all starts with these hearings. It starts with a thoughtful process. Um, we all, I think, acknowledge, and, and I think the speaker's right, uh, that we don't want to be the ones that are there. But I think there's a, there's a dynamic that's challenging for the legislature because they have a whole lot of people behind them that have election certificates. And when we're in there negotiating, I'm trying to negotiate from that position. They're trying to negotiate with all of their members, and there is some of that. So yes, if you want it out of us, everything we can do. Will we disappoint you? Yes, I'm sure we will disappoint you. Um, but our pledge is, is to move closer and closer to that, because I think these are healthy discussions, because people want to know what projects are getting in there, and how'd you decide on that? I yeah, want to add, if, uh, if just to, to go on to what Senator Gazelka had said about One Minnesota, we're going to do the NCSL negotiations in the morning, but we're going to have a really good conversation and workshop the rest of the day on this issue of how we how we go through the session, how we keep things transparent, how we use the committee processes and the conference committees and really get engagement from um, all legislators. I've been on the bicameral bipartisan planning team for this year and it's going to be, I think it's going to be a pretty fascinating process that we go through. Yeah, and I, I think it, it, I think the good thing is that bonding is a little bit different than, than the other bills that we do and they're a little bit more straightforward. They're easier to understand. They don't usually, they're not filled with really complex language that is difficult to weed through, and I think that that's helpful. It's very project-based, which is helpful when it comes to um, when it comes to daylight. I, I do get a little frustrated when I when I hear about the process at the end of the last session and how it was so much better. I don't think I suspect none of you have forgotten the tribunal, and some of you were were turned away from from uh, being able to do your job as the press. The reality is, it was not an open and transparent process. Uh, absolutely, it was it was. 
one of the least transparent processes we have seen, um, particularly locking out much of the legislature. Uh, so I, I, think, I think it's a little disingenuous to get too excited about that. But again, I think the good thing about bonding, much more straightforward. Those projects are much easier to understand. The language is very clear. Uh, and, and that helps all along the way for this process. And it also helps that it's, it's a requirement to involve the minority caucuses when it comes to bonding. And that also helps because it forces additional cooperation. So that, that's a really important piece of I this. I would echo that. And, and I share the representatives and the senators uh, life of hell in the minority because I suffered <laughs> through that. I do get that. And I think the representative brought up a good point. This was an end of session conversation um, where the minority leader made it clear that around bonding, um, that is where they really have leverage and, and felt like they didn't have more of that. So I, I hear that. I think there needs to be an effort and I'm trying the best I can to try and continue to have that outreach to, to felt that you heard. I always said that, that if I ever got back to the majority as a member of Congress, that I would remember what it felt like to be in the minority and extend that. So uh, you, you have our pledge to do that because it is, it is a tough existence because you were sent there by your voters, you have a place, um, you certainly feel like you want to be heard. So bonding, I think that's a very good point. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I need six of them to go with me one way or another. So, <laughs> and I'm working them right now. So, <laughs> so am I. <laughs> All right, so we're r running a little bit low on time, hoping to take up a couple more issues before we let you all go. Um, first, a question for the speaker and for the majority leader. Where are things on insulin? Well, I think there was some good progress made. There's two things that happened that were promising. There's a bipartisan uh, group of legislators that met over the summer and made some progress. And then after that um, didn't achieve agreement, uh, Senator Pratt and Representative Howard had some very productive conversations. I would say we're getting uh, closer. I think the governor and I have some frustration uh, that we feel that we have moved considerably and that it's time for Republicans to make a major move and the considerable move we have made is to agree that the taxpayers of the state of Minnesota, who have not contributed to creating this problem, will participate in funding a solution to the problem. Now, we are asking the Republicans to come forward and say that the pharmaceutical industry that has created this problem will participate in a solution and in the form of money, not coupons for their products. You know, they produce insulin for five or six dollars a vial and then they sell it for three hundred to thirteen hundred dollars a vial. They want to argue that their contribution to solving the problem is to give some vials of insulin to consumers. And coupons are great, but they want to get credit at the $1,300 rate, like they're contributing so, so much to help uh, solve this problem that they have created. They need to contribute in the form of cash. They have gotten rich off of Minnesotans who need insulin to survive, and they need to participate in the solution. We've moved, and, um, and it's time for the Republicans to take a step forward. So first of all, what, what we accomplished last year, because that was bipartisan and, and important, la well, it is last year, mm -hmm. um, by the pressure that uh, all of us uh, put on the pharmaceutical industry, they lowered the, the cost of insulin, generic insulin, in, I believe, half. And then with the language we passed uh, coming out of session that the governor signed, all the insurance companies, I believe all of them now, have lowered to $25 a month or, or free for insulin, so that, that's a, those are big steps forward. Uh, but we acknowledged uh, with the House that uh, there are situations where we should provide emergency insulin. And so the, where we broke down is we propo our emergency pro proposal had a 30-day supply of insulin uh, at the pharmacy. Uh, it required a $75 copay around the country. Typically, it was 100. Um, it was for all legal Minnesota residents with family income less than 400% of poverty. So we clearly had significant steps, and we wanted the, the pharmaceutical industry to provide to the pharmacies that those resources. And so um, I don't, you know, I often say if we can get 70%, take the 70%, whether it's sexual harassment, whether it's uh, emergency insulin, we shouldn't be afraid to take steps to the goal that we're trying to make. And so that's why it's frustrating for me, because we genuinely wanted to get this done. We could have got a long way there, and it could have still you know, been a discussion in session for whatever we didn't do. But So we're going to put forward that bill as well, and, and uh, both sides are going to try to work at it. But I say 
Take 70 percent. It's, it's, a, it's a big step that we can both agree on. Well, in both sexual harassment and insulin, what the Senate is currently proposing is going backwards from existing law and actually making things harder for Minnesotans than they are under existing law. So their insulin proposal would cost consumers more than what the pharmaceutical industry is already doing for free. So that's not a 70 percent uh, coming our way thing. You know, it's, it's a nice idea if that were accurate. And on sexual harassment, they're proposing to make the law a whole lot worse. So it's not like we've actually gotten anywhere closer together. The positions the Senate ha has taken have been worse for Minnesota consumers than current law. So the proposal that I read, is that is that a bad proposal? I mean, to me, that's really positive stuff for insulin. The co-pays in the Senate proposal right now are greater than what is under current law and the, the programs that they already provide. Um, you know, this is this is probably not the space to negotiate out the I'm, insulin I'm, bill, but I think that we Madam, have more Madam work Speaker, to do. I withdraw the question. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get it done. I, uh, I've said that, and I, uh, again, I think the continuing to talk, there's been a lot of frustration around this. We, we really owe it to folks to get this um, and get it done as soon as possible. So my hope is you know that people are still working. They're talking it. I'm, I'm going to encourage again yep. for us to do this, and, and I think as the question that Brian asked was is, is that I, I think if we did this in the public, we could work out the differences and be done. We are so eager for these conversations to happen in the public eye. Uh, earlier today, Secretary Simon was joined with uh, Senator Rest and a number of Republicans as well are on board this bill to protect the party choice of voters in the upcoming primary. Uh, DFL Chairman Ken Martin said a short while ago he supports this bill. Uh, I don't know if anyone yet here has heard from uh, Chairman Carnahan, but I'm interested in the triumvirate of the Speaker, the Governor, and the Majority Leader of the Senate. Um, where do you guys stand on it? I uh, have to talk to my caucus, which I will do on Monday, uh, February 10th, all day. Um, but I suspect that a bill like that would pass the Minnesota House of Representatives, and we would send that over to the Senate. I think there's one really important public service that the media can provide for Minnesotans <coughs> is explaining how we got to where we are. This is a party's nominating process. So we used to have DFL precinct caucuses where you could go in and you could cast your straw poll in 08 for Obama or... Clinton or in 16 for Bernie Sanders or Clinton. And we had these uh, very large crowds. In 2016, I think there were 17 or 22 Republican candidates for president. And we all had, uh, both parties had people standing outside of high schools and elementary schools and churches waiting for hours just to get in and cast their straw poll. And the Democrats have the right to nominate their candidate. The Republicans have the right to have only Republicans participate in their process. And in both cases, I believe, you have to sign in as a member of the party to participate in that party's nominating process. What Minnesotans said to us is, please make this more convenient for us. But it's still a party nominating process. So the premise we started with was that Democrats get information on Democrats and Republicans get information on Republicans because it is the, the party's process. Now, that was mis misunderstood, in, in my opinion, the, the position that Senator Kiffmeyer has taken and that we're stuck with in Minnesota law because she won't change her mind, is that the Republicans get data on Democrats, data on the marijuana parties, and data on Republicans. Um, I think the proposal that Secretary Simon is coming forward with is much more protective than where we all started, but um, I'm definitely in favor of bringing it forward. I just am a little pessimistic we'll be able to get Senator Kiffmeyer to agree to hear the bill. I spoke with Senator Simon this afternoon. We're, of course, uh, digging into this, too. Um, we want to make sure that we make uh, it easy as possible for people to vote. We also want to make sure that data privacy is a top priority. I am nervous. Because um, I'm already hearing this and, and, and fielding some talk. Uh, what are judges supposed to do? Right. Um, clergy, others who have called us about what this does, because it, I think the fear is, is that it, it makes things where people are very, very careful about it's their right and they can go vote that private ballot, but what do we do with that? So I think for us, we're in a position trying to gather more information. I, from a, a philosophical perspective, I'm, I'm really nervous about that, the idea of having to make judges go in and, and have that, and that that will be public data then, I think really upsets some of the balance that, that has seemed to work here. So we'll, we'll continue to explore it. Uh, so first of all, I generally support my chairs, but um, uh, on this particular issue, I moved forward when we had uh, both major parties came to an agreement. 
uh, we passed the legislation. And then for me now, midstream in this election cycle to change it, I think is a mistake. Uh, the, the public data is, I mean, the data is protected from the general public. The parties get the data. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly open to talking about it, but typically uh, something of this nature, I would rather come to a place again where both parties agree, or four parties, I guess now, but uh, agree with the direction and then we all get behind that. So I don't want to change it midstream, but uh, if you convince my chair, I'll listen even more. If I may, I'm sorry, um, Senator Ken, I should ask you, because there's a possibility with the break, with the makeup in the Senate that that position doesn't carry the day. I think if people look at Senator Rest's bill, it looks like a very common sense proposal that I think will make an awful lot of sense to Minnesotans when they think about this, the, the reality of what a, a, a nominating primary is. Um, it is a party event. Um, it protects people's data and privacy, um, and uh, it, it makes it, it really limits the use of what anybody can do with any of that data. Um, I, I find it really hard to think that anybody who takes a serious look at this is going to have a problem with it. It's, it's the common sense solution to, to the situation we find ourselves in right now. All right, one more quick question and then we'll let you all go. Um, wondering what each of you views as the top priority of this legislative session and how much the upcoming election might affect that. And maybe this time we'll start on the right. Sure. So for me, and I, and I believe I can speak for my caucus on this, is we still feel a real need to wrap our arms around what's happening at DHS. Um, I know uh, Governor Walls, we, are, we appreciate that um, on multiple occasions he, he indicated that he is open to an audit of the department. And I think that is really critical. Right now, what we have seen the, from the internal audits is frankly very little. They, the, their internal audits happening at DHS have not brought to light any of the issues that we currently know about. Those those issues were brought forward via whistleblowers, the press digging in, these kinds of things. Um, and, and so I, I, I think that we have a real lack of confidence that we have our arms wrapped around what the real problems are. Um, we are, of course, open, open to the idea of breaking up the department. I have said on multiple occasions I have real concerns about breaking up the department without digging in and figuring out where all of the problems are. I think all we are doing is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, if that's what we do. Um, it will make us feel like we are doing something. We would like to give the appearance that we are doing something. But if all we do is, is, uh, is split the department, we're not actually doing anything. Yeah, yeah fixing DHS would be, uh, that would be awesome. Um, even if we took a few bites of that, I think would be important uh, for Minnesota. Um, but my top priority in light of what I just said is that we get the bonding bill done this year um, and that it focus on wastewater infrastructure, roads and bridges, and uh, higher heaper and the other public buildings uh, that we need to maintain. If we can do that, um, some, there are some years that uh, we've been dysfunctional in this place and we haven't been able to get it done, and I'm not speaking about last year, but just where there was not that sense of communication on something I think that's very important. But if we can fix DHS, I'm good with that, too. Well, you have my pledge, and I, I appreciate the, the thoughtfulness of Representative. You're exactly right, and that's what we're proposing. Make sure we have that third-party look. We deep dive. I think there are some intermediate things that we can do around process with the, uh, the commissioner and the work that's over there to show people, because I think they're they're rightfully so. This is an important agency that delivers incredible services, um, and we need to get it right. And so all the good things are doing gets canceled out by this. Most states have gone through these growing pains already, so there are examples already out there. But I recognize, much like Minlar's, this is going to be a trust issue that's going to have to be done hand in hand. Um, and every step of the way, Senator Newman was in that room with, with us to make sure. And I would mention this, that we had a, a, a long conversation yesterday with Senator Benson, who is equally committed to getting this right, I think brings some really good ideas to the table. So we'll work with you on that. But for me, it's capital investment and preservation. It's where the state is at. We have historically low interest rates. We are at a point now where we're as strong as ever. We know there's historic needs from about $18 billion in infrastructure to about $7.1 billion at the University of Minnesota. Um, the numbers are almost incalculable on water and uh, water treatment. Um, with that being said, the state People of Minnesota requested about $5.3 billion. We are in a strong financial place to take these things off the table. It's what any strong business would do. We would not 
missed the opportunity to leverage $180 million at 1.1% interest to get $2 billion of indirect investment that has a $10 billion multiplier to it while retaining those things, especially in local communities, $300 million uh, around local roads and bridges, $260 million around housing. Those are things right there which makes up a big chunk of this bill that they're talking about across the state. So I'm, I'm very hopeful we can get this, um, and, and it goes a long ways to securing our future for taking care of these things that we've kicked around too long. Well, this is apparently your kumbaya moment of the um, <laughs> forum news uh, <laughs> gathering, because I think uh, Representative New has well stated the important role of oversight that the legislature has mm -hmm. of executive branch agencies, and the governor, as the governor, also feels a strong uh, compulsion to exercise his oversight authority of this department department and make sure it's functioning well and that we all share the commitment to not leap into things like slicing the department into pieces that wouldn't actually accomplish anything but might make us look like we're busy. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a shared commitment to having a bonding bill. Uh, my uh, view of that is we should have the largest responsible size bonding bill that we can have. So when we look at the debt guidelines for the state, whatever we can do and preserve our AAA bond rating is what we should do. Uh, the governor spoke very eloquently of the um, deep needs that there are in this state. There are a lot of unmet needs, and so we should go as big as we responsibly can under the debt guidelines. And I will... Uh Add to the kumbaya here um, on the DHS piece. I, you know, I think it's really important that we first do no harm um, and make sure that we're really clear on what we're doing before we take major steps. And on the bonding side, one thing I would be interested to watch as this goes through, um, uh, Senator Gazelka talked about transportation, um, and I have no opposition to including transportation in a bonding bill. But we need to be clear that we cannot bond our way out of our, our serious problems with our infrastructure and our roads and our bridges in this state. So um, we need to not um, kid the people of Minnesota. We need to be responsible in how we do that. And I'll also say um, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the governor's emphasis on housing. That's something I hear about all over the state. Um, and uh, he came out to Woodbury today to help dedicate uh, a new uh, low-income senior living facility. And it's the kind of work that we can do with bonding. We can provide really wonderful housing for a low cost to seniors by leveraging just a little bit of bonding money with all the available tax credits and private money and, and county and state. It was in county and city. It was a really amazing opportunity to see that. And um, we need to be doing a lot more of that around the state. Well, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out to come to the Forum 2020 Forum. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you to Senate Media Services for broadcasting this. We really appreciate it for folks who can't make it out today. Um, and also to the Senate Sergeant at Arms for giving us a place to have this meeting. Very important. Um, that's about it. Thank you all, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you next week. Oh, and now the bars are out. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. We end as we begin.